Hello everyone, today we talk about Iberian warfare between the end of the 4th and say the mid 2nd century BC for the Hellenistic era warfare series. Thus, it's just um, an introduction that we will have to complement with lots of other videos, primarily about ancient battles, but also looking specifically at the tactics of the single units and armament in detail, again, in dedicated videos um, each. So thinking that we will not do today, evidently, we will thus just try to provide with a comprehensive picture of actually a, a very impressive set of uh, military cultures that lived in the Iberian Peninsula uh, at the time. Uh, as you know, um, we have seen it also in other videos about the Iberian warfare uh, throughout the ages because, of course, the country in itself has some features that remain over time. We've made lots of videos about the Reconquista. We have seen what, what a terrible ground um, Spain is uh, for, for warfare, right? Uh, you know, it, it's very varied, definitely. There is essentially a, a cold north. Right, it resembles some some kind of Celtic um, scenario of sort, where indeed already at this time you could find populations that were quite similar to the ones of Central Europe that live on uh, extremely rugged terrain, and, and that uh, would be in fact the most uh, the last ones to, to be tamed by the Romans after more than two hundred years of uh, fighting in the peninsula, then you have uh, essentially a, um, e enormous plateaus uh, covered with essentially the, some traits with semi-arid uh, terrain with great thermic excursion between day and night uh, surmounted by hilltops scattered all over again this, this vastity uh, which uh, is terrifying, right? there are lots of reliefs a lot of uh, forests, rivers, um, and at the time, the, this space is not is not urbanized fundamentally, but it's uh, proto-urbanized at least, which means that the the various hill forts are located, in fact, on the on the top of these reliefs, uh, dominated wide areas uh, of great uh, frontier. Right, that's how. Um, the space was at the time, if anything, because uh, the area had not been organized by the Romans yet, in the way it basically remained up to, to a certain point in history, because during the Reconquista, fundamentally, a, a new frontier emerged, and thus the uh, great areas of the center went depopulated accordingly. They passed uh, from agriculturalism to um, to, to, to cattle breeding, fundamentally. And in in ancient times, before the Roman conquest, this was also the case because of the chronic political fragmentation. Essentially, the Bering Peninsula was populated by uh, uh, tens of different uh, tribes, at least to be recognized of a you know, similar size with one another that were constantly uh, in uh, at war with, with each other. Right? You had again uh, a Celtic north. Uh, where people from Central Europe had fundamentally uh, settled, right, to mostly Celticize culturally the, the rest of the population, in fact, did maintain even their distinctive Iberian uh, traits. Then you have um, the Lusitanians in the in the West on, on the uh, on the Atlantic, also of Indo-European origin, right. They were also mixed with the Celts. Um, in, in other groups. Then you have um, the widest uh, part of Spain occupied by uh, Iberians. These were pre Indo European populations of uh, debated, practically unknown origin. Probably they, they came from North, had come from North Africa back in the day um, and, and, and other places, um, which occupied the richest. Part in the south and on the Mediterranean coast, um, what would be Baetica, uh, later Andalusia, right, uh, was in, in the far south, would become uh, one of the single most impactfully Romanized uh, provinces 
later on, but was already rich. It had been colonized by the Carthaginians due to the the abundant mineral resources that had also a lot to do in in, in the Iberian Peninsula, as we will see now, with the advanced metallurgic skills of, of these populations, with uh, essentially the, the overlapping of the uh, Latin um, craftsmanship and the the, the barren one uh, in a in a militarized space that thus um, expressed one of the finest arms and armor production in the world uh, at the time and, and the barren peoples are fundamentally um, you know they're also essentially tribesmen however gradually brought first under the Carthaginians, Rome before that also under the Greek influx so much that there has been a debate on whether certain uh, weaponry was, you know, kind of such as the famed Falcata was, was imported by the Hellenes, which doesn't seem to, f to be the case because, you know, the, the barons seem to have already developed kind of their own version before Hellenic uh, colonization. And always remember, different weapons can appear in different countries uh, that do not have any particular uh, relation, uh, at least like a consistent one and direct, kind of, for example, military confrontation, whatever. Uh, and uh, swords like those, like essentially, would be the copies of the Machaira, were, were present all over, all over the Mediterranean, uh, as we know. In fact, as we will see now, we'll talk about the influx that evidently Iberian culture had on the Roman equipment, but uh, in many ways that, that doesn't just explain it by itself, because the Romans already had things like, you know, the, the copies, you know, you know, dramatic size, we've seen that in, in archaic Roman warfare videos, but it's from Spain that they would get the, essentially, the model of this superimposition of a Latin a straight blade with essentially a, a specular kind of doubling of the curved falcata on the same on the same blade, which in fact would be called by the same Romans as the gladius hispaniensis, due to uh, the the place of origin, which, which they had interiorized, you know, they had at least conceptually come from. Um, I will not discuss that in in depth because. I made a video about the Gladius Hispaniensis just recently, some, some month ago, and I will keep discussing that also as far as properly the, uh, the, the development of the same in the Roman military, how it happened. There is no doubt that um, the Roman-Spanish warfare was the one that really brought some of, of the greatest um, consequences in, in uh, Roman arms and armor uh, uh, development um, because of the definitely savage nature of the local military culture, right? The, the barbarians say, uh, I don't know which term to use, I'm talking generally speaking about Celtiberians, Lusitanians, and Iberians altogether because their warfare really didn't differ that much, right? And we have to be clear about this because and I repeat it often in my ancient warfare videos, um, the standard warrior uh, at the time in, in the sanitary world in, in Europe, in, in the Mediterranean, was a guy with an oval shield, a couple of javelins slash spears, essentially a sword uh, of some kind, and if he was affluent, you know, an helmet, and uh, some other armor, right? But fundamentally, the concept is identically the same, that the guy can uh, can definitely fight on horseback as well. And this is the standard every freaking wear, right? There is not essentially a difference uh, between these people. So, so what we're analyzing here is rather the variations, right, in some secondary aspects that are, of course, revealing. There are definitely important, right? So we'll try to, to trace here a kind of a difference, but say maybe we can talk about the extremes from north to south, say between the more Celtic influenced areas and the uh, the, the Iberian ones, but say how do you characterize a, a Lusitanian, 
in terms of arms and armor. Yes, of course, you can't point at various finds, etc., but it's mostly iconographic evidence um, and uh, archaeological one in terms of you, know, you find the actual weapons, etc., and you, you realize there that the differences were extremely uh, few, right? In the essence, we're talking about the same warfare, the same armament, uh, and largely the same tactics as well. Uh, naturally, ancient historiographers tended to stereotype um, on the base of some kind of fact of national background by saying, you know, this people has more this tendency and then this one, this other, they carry out this tactic, they have this practice, whatever. Yet, um, this is mostly like the rationalization of practices that existed, of course, but pretty much everywhere, right? And just in among a people or another could be more or less pronounced due mostly to some political or social reason or maybe a certain bias or subjective interpretation of, of of that altered. Sometimes, in fact, you find even contrasting information. So we'll try to to give an answer to this in a, in a, in a concrete sense. Um, so there's really a lot to talk about about Iberian warfare because of the size, first of all, of the space. Right? As I often point out, uh, France is larger than Spain, but if you sum uh, Portugal to the latter, you have a larger country than France, which means this is something huge, right? And uh, it's it's also a fairly um, populated place at the time, not, uh, say, enormously, especially uh, in the north, but in the south you have really a lot of endemic concentration, as we've seen, you have also uh, uh, a warm weather, a fertile soil, uh, Baitica was very, very an agricultural reality, it's well located in terms of trade, there are, there are the, the straits, um, there is uh, just an opening to, for example, the western Mediterranean that is colonized by the Carthaginians and the Greeks, um, so you have uh, a massive interland and then a highly diversified one, by the way, that sells a lot, right? That is pretty much open to to um, not just to relations of different kind with with other peoples, but that also is um, renownedly uh, mercenary uh, oriented. Right. Uh, today we will not talk, for example, specifically about I don't know the Balearic slingers, but that that's a good example, right? To of of, uh, of a people that, of course, it were, you know, regional and provincial variations of all well, these various cultures, and that are also interesting, in fact, to, to analyze. But um, Iberian mercenaries were pretty much used, as you know, by the the Carthaginians, by the Romans. Right, were used to serve abroad, uh, and they knew thus what the the world was about in some of the most advanced contexts. Um, and warfare came in their land from abroad as well, first with the Carthaginians, then with the Romans. So what you look at here is mostly the, the history of the of the Punic Wars. Uh, where the Romans managed essentially to strip the, the Carthaginians of the control, the most productive areas of the Iberian Peninsula, and more than 200 years, as we were saying before, of Roman conquest, and some of the single most radically brutal um, military theaters that the Romans ever got into. Right, um, The Spaniards were savage guerrilla warfare, and Rome paid an enormous cost to conquer the entire peninsula that, as you know, would be accomplished only in Augustan times. Um, it's as if the Iberian Peninsula had been Rome's Vietnam, except Rome won in the end, and as you know, the Roman campaigns uh, in the Iberian Peninsula were the ones that effectively triggered the so-called recruitment crisis in the second century BC. Uh, I never made a video about the Roman conquest of Spain, but I'm going to do uh, it uh, hopefully. So we'll see a bit better what were the causes of this, because there is no doubt that the uh, Iberian peoples were um, resilient and fanatic 
uh, defenders and you know skilled guerrilla fighters and all. However, we're still talking about essentially already what Rome was like, like a proper civilization, um, investing itself uh, in essentially as as Rome was habituated at that point, right, in the control of the coastal areas, right, and not having much of an actual political or social, cult, broader cultural interest in the subjugation of the interland, right, except when you want to control especially the rich uh, uh, mines, when you want to create a greater stability for maintaining these provinces, of course, pacified, you have to invest yourself also in the interland, and, and that's where the Romans mostly you know, uh, went there first, right, in, in continental Europe, because uh, of the important fact, uh, moral and material resources that were agitating in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, on the other hand, however, the Romans were not particularly committed to Spain, as it, they, they, they hadn't been to, you know, to Numidia or to, to other places that, um, in fact, at some point, uh, brought to to the Romans to 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 create essentially that a fully professional military. As you know, the, the the recruitment crisis was surpassed exactly in connection with the Numidian War, where you know there had been Roman allies that had been fighting at the siege of Numantia uh, that had brought to the final subjugation of the Celtic barons and fundamentally of the overall control. Of the Iberian Peninsula by by the Romans, um, so the impressive series of Roman defeats, especially against the Lusitanian Viriatus, and uh, you know all the wars that led eventually to to the fall of Numantia after you know decades of continuous warfare, and again ambushes and again se- severe uh, Roman losses, uh, have also much to do with the the as always, with as in any war, with the degree of political commitment to that, right? At this point, Rome had definitely all the, the resources to conquer Spain, and she even did it, right? It took a couple of centuries. Um, but this is to be framed not just in a context of, of local resistance, but also, again, of, of uh, offensive commitment, which wasn't quite there for many reasons in the mid-2nd century BC. Um, and this is important to appreciate uh, Iberian, as much as Roman warfare as well, because, uh, as, as you know, we are close of Isians here, and so we see war just as a continuation of, of politics with other means and nothing else, right? This is not a, a video game or a football match or whatever. Uh, this is real politics, real warfare, uh, real social issues, and uh, as with most of you know resistance to to the Roman conquest from essentially tribal peoples that were at a lower developmental stage uh, than than Rome at that point, uh, you have mostly uh, just just a dynamic of this guy. Right? It's it's ridiculous to presume I don't know that the Romans didn't have the the manpower to conquer some fringe areas like I don't know you could pick. Caledonia or even Germany or whatever um, into just um, control them. It, it, the, the point is always how convenient was it for them? That's the only question that you have to answer, right? There is no doubt there was a resistance that also what is to be taken into account in that calculation but it's hardly a matter of uh, particular say military quality from, from the other side that, that produced this fundamentally. And this is difficult to discuss sometimes because the, the more videos I made about the, uh, say, the, the Roman Empire in general, the more I meet with this kind of um, alienated generation of, of kids that, you know, maybe they are in their 30s right now, but they still have grown this concept that, you know, it, it's it's a typically national socialistic uh, anti-traditional delusion that of course you know uh, w- the only thing that matters is some kind of fictional polities we we call we attach to a sort of so-called national identity that are supposed to be i don't know what end right a sort of 
never changing reality that uh, for some reason emerged from nowhere that was always there uh, all these peoples as I explained countless times were exclusively founded properly in terms of political identity on world domination right from the smallest tribe to the largest empire and the only discrimination here we can make it in between those who succeeded and those who failed that right and so when um looking at the this is something you can appreciate also in, in our unfortunately in our culture today that less developed cultures uh states whatever you know are you know aggrandized by not even much by themselves but by those who within western civilization want to self-sabotage western civilization mostly because they are marginated within it mostly because they are failed individuals and so they they want to destroy hierarchy order um uh authority uh the elite uh the essentially all visible display of power just because they cannot afford to have one right so this is always the same rhetoric of the fourth estate that cannot accept that um, whatever happens to a person is completely and exclusively and totally their fault right even when there is an external agent right you know it's, it's how you react to it that makes the difference and of course starting the uh, Iberian warfare is, and also the history of these peoples were defeated. Right, St- studying the history of the defeated is, from from in a certain sense, more interesting than than the one of of the victors, and not because uh, history is written by the winners, which is, as a phrase, one of the single most precise indicator of cultural, educational, and individual inferiority. Because of course, history is not written by victors; it's written by historians, first of all. And, you know, ask Polybius or Flavius Josephus, by the way, just to remain in a Roman context, you know, who, who did write history. But because these people arrived to pay a price, right, for, for their defeat, that uh, at that point they had believed in. So essentially they, uh, they uh, thought they could achieve a result which was not met, in fact, and that instead brought to... Uh, a political defeat and, and all what that entails and in the ancient world of course all these populations were um, carrying out the same identical things they eventually uh, suffered in, in this case as conquered peoples on on each other right that's what always perplexes me when people again take sides by saying i don't know that there was some problem with what the romans were doing while all oh, Right, and there is not a single people in the world that didn't fundamentally and and essentially just exist in order to rape, enslave, and massacre the person next door. Right, uh, which like in imperial warfare, like in basically any other, again, is the norm. Right, so um, these are not just dialectical necessities to state, but it's just you know if you are you have arrived at you know, 20, 30, or 40 in your life still thinking that, you know, the the other way around is is the correct one. Well, again, there is a severe problem behind that. Like, as mentally speaking, uh, I don't know, relationally speaking, something must have struck there that is absolutely not normal, right? And can't cause uh, grotesque damage to your entire existence at a point that is, at, at this point especially, incredibly difficult to reverse because it's definitely a, an ancestral issue that uh, it, properly the concept of manhood is supposed to remove at some point and of course we live in in, 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 in conditions where of course the concept of manhood or many others is completely removed but again whining about such things is one of the singles a single most again precise indicators of personal failure on all levels of, of existence. Um, history, in this sense, is beautiful because it just doesn't give a damn about whoever you are, which is a beautiful thing. Um, when we look at Iberian warfare, again, we look at toughness, 
there's no doubt about this. The, the Spaniards were regarded as good troops proper, right? There is a segmentation here, and again, if you look at the north, mostly they were tribesmen. In the south, the with urbanization, by this, especially by the side of, of the conquerors and this greater you know, advancement, uh, exposition to civilization, etc., had brought even the local systems to be um, somehow more soldier oriented. Not, not to say actually that the interland, this is true for everywhere, for Gaul, for, um, was any different uh, if it was close to, say, I don't know, Atlantic cities than it was, again, from the other side of Spain, right? This is something that people tend to get wrong, such as things, I don't know, the southern Gauls had kind of more compact infantry because they, they were influenced by the Greeks. What? What? <laughs> like, you know, th these are, again, people have played too much video games, and uh, again, pay playing video games in itself is not a negative thing, but then there, there is also the moment of actual history books, actually actual scientific publications, and again, that's yet another indicator that there is no strategic culture of any kind. Uh, however, as, as we were saying before, the fact that these troops had served abroad, and especially in armies of really advanced uh, people, such as the Carthaginians, um, had brought uh, you know, significant uh, you know, uh, advancement in some tactics, practices. The, the word was growing, right? Um, and the main problem of the politics that hired mercenaries like, I don't know, the Spaniards, the, the Celts, and so on, was essentially to discipline these troops their own way, the Carthaginian way, the Roman way, etc. Um, to be full, to be integrated, at least, you know, tactically at, uh, at the moment in their in fact, in their armies, in, in their military system, right? And thus they were measured as such. Naturally, all these peoples, as tribal peoples, were ill-disciplined, right? They had a loose political cohesion. They had incredibly varying allegiance. So um, it was complicated to teach them, right, in the absence of a of a state locally, what that was even meant to be. However, the Iberian mercenaries uh, displayed this fierce and determined behavior, which stemmed essentially from this traumatically um, and unspeakably violent background from which they came from, right? And we will try to explain it to the fullest here, because... Uh, Normal a 21st century person is normally is not even properly presented with an adequate background to frame correctly what it means to be, I don't know, an Iberian warrior of the third century BC, right? If you have never ripped apart a human being alive, um, you, you cannot even begin to phantom what 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 all the it's not just warfare; it's like the entire political and social system was about, right? Um, the Romans also found out the hard way, as we were saying before, um, and generally speaking, again, I say, I will say Spanish, right? I know that it's not correct, but if I say just Iberian, it seems that I'm leaving the Celtiberians or the Lusitanians out, right? So I will just say Spanish. I know it's not entirely correct, even for the concept of Hispania of the time, because there were also other... Uh, entities con conceived uh, politically and territorially, but um, c consider that there were differences even in conceiving what actual Spain was, right? Some connected it with some kind of also Occitanian character, proto-Occitanian character from their own westwards, right? Today we talk, of course, just about the Iberian Peninsula. But that is to say also that, again, we're talking about realities that do not quite correspond to the modern national identities, even though, of course, they have a lot to do with them, uh, unavoidably. Uh, so, in order, of course, to conquer such a large country like Spain, 
whoever uh, like the Carthaginians, the Romans would have to hire large amounts of troops that we had to forge um, alliances with the local peoples and most of the time actually they they worked right we don't have to think about a monolithic uh, picture where I don't know somebody steps in these countries and everybody's against that invader absolutely not right a half was pro and another against because of course uh, these peoples were um, elites as always were anxious to enter bigger circles and to benefit from that right so always consider when we look at the Roman Empire it's not a, something where I don't know the, uh, the the Italians came exterminated everyone and they filled it with no right it doesn't happen even in countries like these where peoples began to speak a, a lot in language as opposed to I don't know Iberian or Celtic or whatever um, so it's always about the decisive moral support of the local population that allows any empire to exist, right? Without that, there cannot be any form of government, right? And there can be just uh, open warfare, right? And that is always mitigated because total war does not exist. Um, thus... Um, we, we tend to underappreciate this aspect. I mean, especially, again, the concept of hiring so many troops that eventually will stay under your uh, banners, will, uh, will, will serve also abroad, etc. We will surely make some video about how, I don't know, the, the use, say, of, of Spanish auxiliaries in, in the Roman army. It's a big deal. Mostly they were, as we'll see now, considered as good horsemen. But their infantry are really something. Uh, as well. Um, Spanish troops were, again, ill-disciplined, right? They they were in individually, as individual warriors were were great, right? All tribal peoples, you have this kind of charismatic sense of the hero that is, of course, to increase the, the control and thus the discipline over uh, his subordinates, but that, again, is just one among the many and that there are not quite properly statal realities that can enforce that r rigid uh, teeth breaking back breaking discipline from which you cannot escape like you know from the roman one um so the spaniards could get out of hand for example if they were winning right trying to 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 block them while they were chasing an enemy was was difficult from you know, the, 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 the perspective of disciplined, drilled forces like the the, the Roman ones. Um, and there is a, a sense, as we will see now, that uh, was highlighted by the first encounters between the Romans and, um, and, and, and the locals, which uh, that has been created, it's been an historiographical thing that claimed that beyond this kind of guerrilla warfare, uh, the parents didn't have much of more advanced tactics or strategies. And this is an interesting point because sometimes we want to just pat uh, to, to pat people on their shoulder and say, okay, well, this is not true because every people had a, a level of military development. Yeah, okay, th this is absolutely true. I, as you know, made a, um, a series about the Fondkrieg and we discussed there quite abundantly what it means to to fight with what is properly the, the, the fluid, the dynamic nature of warfare. And we have seen how if you resort to guerrilla, you are the weaker side, right? There is no strategic doubt about this. Right? If you have a military advantage in absolute terms, you just pass to counterattack with concentrated forces in open field because what you want at that point is to uh, retake as quickly as possible what you are continuing to suffer from the loss of, uh, and as long as you stay under and the 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 enemy controls the, the flatlands, the agricultural areas, the cities, um, whatever, and you have just to hide in the mountains, you are the weaker one. There, there is no way around that. This is a uh, a constant. It's not an opinion, right? So, the fact that we do not have much else uh, about Iberian warfare, but essentially guerrilla, aside from the uh, times in which these troops were 
employed by the Carthaginians and the Romans, they they hope that they they made some brilliant last stands, especially in the Carthaginian armies against the Romans, in some of the most famous battles of, of the Second Punic War. There is no doubt. Um, but it, it, it tells us, generally speaking, that uh, the local polities were not developed enough to be able to afford much more than guerrilla warfare, just per se. This is, these are the same words of Publius Cornelius Scipio not yet Africanus, who simply said, by, as you know, entering in important relations with the Celtic barons, etc., that these were these peoples were very good at guerrilla. But, I mean, very good. I mean, the same word guerrilla was invented in Spain for a reason, which was absolutely actual at that time as well. But the same Roman general said, look, these are essentially not capable, however, to do more than that, right? In, in open field, they fundamentally they suck. And again, the reason is not how again the alienated ethno-nationalist fourth estater without education today thinks like there is something inherently wrong to I don't know that that people individually, right? Because that person completely misses, and I mean entirely, the concept of collective training and how the civilizational development is connected with that. Right. This is one of the single greatest problems that the, especially the youth, but I mean, even elderly people still have, unmasked today, um, as they miss the entire point of civilization in the first place. Right. So, um, the, 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 the concept of, for example, again, beginning to win and becoming overconfident and disorganized. Right, and not responding to orders anymore. Because you know that even if you don't, you still have to respond in the, in a different way than, than if we were in a kind of in a regular army. And it becomes mostly a matter of mob uh competition between wh- whichever clan rules at home. Uh is a negative trait, right? It it speaks of again that degree of less centralized power that cannot provide with a successful military in the long run. So as we'll see now, no doubt, how tactically and strategically effective Spanish guerrilla warfare was. Right? He, the guerrilla has it's, a, it's actually a strong form of, of war. Right? So it has a logic and again, the Barian peoples used it excellently. There's no doubt about this. However, in the equation there, you have to take into account that if you are fighting just as guerrilla, it's because you can't, at that moment at least, do more. Um, and in the equation of the clash with the Romans, you have always to, in that sense, enter the political commitment as much as the ultimate uh, end, that is to say, the Roman conquest of the entire Barian Peninsula and its control and one of you know the single deepest levels of Romanization, even actual of, of development of prosperity in those provinces. Um, this, this is important also as far as you consider the, the South that was a greater success, the North that remained underdeveloped also in Roman times and also in, in medieval times. Um, so there is something there that also um, half millennia of civilizational control cannot fix just uh, just through again an occupation a, a, a government and whatever however it's um, it must always be seriously and objectively taken in consideration uh, in fact what, what is fascinating from the Atlantic Roman historiography that usually speaks of just a so of the barbarians, albeit in different ways, because of course there is a, a, a radically different concept behind the the Atlantic barbarism and, and the Roman one. The Spaniards um, were depicted as particularly resilient, right? Uh, the idea is that, at least it's it's a bit stereotypical, but that the northern barbarians were capable of this great impetus, especially the, the Celts. And after that, they were done for, right? They could even carry out a last stand. They would 
uh, fight uh, to the death. Um, but that that's what mostly the thing was about. Incidentally, the Germans that were more politically cohesive were instead more compact. They were they they did display. They were not just through the Roman eyes that folked them. This mere kind of disorganized tribal peoples, as much as the the Celts had appeared, they, for example, tried to to always retreat also in good order to to carry out, uh, away the the wounded things like this. Of course. The Romans perceived the limits of, of, of that culture, but they were spot on in identifying certain characters that were consistent also with the levels of political cohesion and and general development of, of the various peoples, right? And, and as far as the Spanish are concerned, well, these looked essentially as um, stubborn, specifically, right? They wouldn't despair if things went badly, but f on the contrary, they fought doggedly on. Um, this character is also part of the kind of this uh, incredibly well-organized net of resistance that the, the local peoples had, because guerrilla corresponded also to a great level of territorial knowledge, not just they were fighting in their home, but this home, as we've seen at the beginning, was nightmarish, to say the least. Uh, you don't really know between Spain, Italy, and and the Balkans, which is the worst battleground in Europe, right? The, the Romans, as we've seen also in recent videos, were not really scared of fighting in the mountains. In the upper night, they had created their, their confederacy, essentially, in that kind of meat grinder. Um, however, again, the, the Barren Peninsula is different because it's it, it has a much wider interland and it, it has this few points of connection um, interspersed again in a, in a rugged and also partly forested um, terrain that um, is difficult to the spaces are huge, right? So it's it's difficult properly to control, right? A great part also of the Roman uh, cohortal development, for example, seems to have occurred in Spain. You know that the cohorts were not invented by any uh, stretch of the imagination by Marius or anything. They were already around from a while, possibly from, in fact, the the Second Punic War in the same Spain in in Scipio's army. Um, but probably the practice was maintained exactly in these provinces because of this occupational uh, uh, strategic uh, problems the Romans had. They had to control huge territory. And the, the Roman legion had been, at that point, developed to remain, to maintain its tactical compactness, right? So much so that it was a problem also for, for, the, for the Spanish. Indeed, because mostly that again the Romans would advance as you know a, a, a compact heavy infantry force mostly, and the the Spanish didn't have much to oppose to that in, in open ground as we just said. So they would continuously skirmish that, and you know just proving again that they couldn't quite break through by just not trying to to wear them out before, and then just launching as we will see now some uh, decisive uh, attacks. Um, but the Romans had needed to control the, the the territory, the communities, and they couldn't just remain, maintain their troops concentrated while the enemy would regain the initiative here and there. So it's likely that the cohort was kind of, um, let's say, uh, established for for good in in the in the Barian theater as far as essentially mini legions from the bigger one were detached to occupy that hill fort, that other, and so being scattered in a way that, you know, is part of the broader strategical necessities of an occupation forces to eventually, you know, be able, hopefully, to also regroup um, in case of need. Because, of course, also the, the Spanish would at some point gather more forces as much as the Roman one. So, uh, again, the, the degree by which eventually would decide to give battle or not is another issue, right? But um, as long as that force is there... And you're also afraid to approach it because, as it was uh, f frequent exactly in this theater, the, the enemy would 
try to ambush you on a regular basis and a uh, lot of, of, of Roman blood was spilled like that, um, the, the, it, it, it all turns into a sort of attritional uh, confrontation. And uh, it, it's definitely to the, um, to, the, to the detriment of the occupant, mostly, that, that this happens. Because you have to ship forces from Italy, as we've seen the, the citizens and the allies stop. Polybius wrote beautiful pages on this. You know, they, they stop properly being, seeing the motivation of going to, to fight overseas among peoples that were renowned for just coming back and uh, attacking the, the enemy at, at all time in the year and in the day, right, in, in a terrifying environment, and this was Spain, right? So the concept of these troops, especially maybe even being defeated, right, being pushed back and so on, but being able to, again, entrench themselves in some uh, hilltops and, you know, fortification and other bases in the woods, whatever, and co continuing to struggle, Right, ask Napoleon. Ask you know th this is um, again a, a constant in, in Iberian warfare. Really, the Reconquista again th displays dramatic similarities with what we have here. Um, also, as far as for example the you know the, the mounted warfare is concerned, I made a video about that. You know, also dispelling the myth, for example, that during the Crusades or the Reconquista it was the Muslims that really had the fastest, the most agile horses. Actually. Uh, since antiquity, you see that the the Iberians had some of the finest and most adaptable breeds that were superior, even as we'll see now, to to the African ones that were considered among the the best. Right. Um, so Iberian garrisons would display such def uh, defensive fanaticism as they would commit, for example, mass suicide or sell out in desperate charges that are described by the ancient sources like blind with fury, rather than surrender, right? This is also typical. Again, if you are in such a situation, it means that strategically you're, you're losing, uh, right? But there is a difference between those who, do, who simply surrender and those who are able to just kill themselves either by poison or by simply charging the enemy without hope, right? And this was part of their culture, of their beliefs. Uh, the the Spanish were consistently less secular and modern than already the Romans were. That, as you know, weren't uh, particularly refined or you know. Uh, uh, particularly sophisticated people as such, and were perfectly, you know, aware of the what what regular brutality w was about just by by lifestyle. Uh, Strabo says that every Iberian carried a bile of poison for suicide, and the story goes that when this poison had effect, um, the jaw of the, the, the people who assumed it uh, would shut, leaving a grin on the corpse that made the Romans freaking out because it looked as if um, these enemies were mocking them from, from the afterlife when they found them with, with that expression. Um, and again, that, that is also pretty pretty evocative uh, as, a, as an image. Naturally, this... Uh, stubbornness extended also to the political um, dimension because uh, Rome was a young power and could definitely exercise a lot of pressure on these peoples but um, not to the degree they could simply convince them to um, to just back down right and just realizing that it was a, a huge monstrous empire out, out there as far as the barbarians saw this throughout the the 3rd the 2nd century BC there was still a consistent capacity to maintain their own if not independence still autonomy uh, boy this is also a bit like the end of Viriatus that uh, at some point began to negotiate with the romans even in particularly strategic um conditions of strategic advantage um because probably they were also exhausted to fight Right, it just wanted to be 
he asked the title of Amicus Populi Romani, so um, simply asking to be, you know, a Roman ally, even after all the, the bloodshed that had occurred, which the Romans would not forgive him, in fact, they assassinated him, uh, anyway. Um, but still seeing, you know, a place for, for, for the Lusitanians, in that case, to simply not to be directly occupied by the Romans, as instead would occur uh, in a while. Um, and the problem was always this also, that of course the Iberian peoples always quarreled with one another, right? They did uh, not keep their war, at least to foreigners, of course it was a great kind of, again, sense of loyalty, we will see it now with the devotee of the this, uh, this deeply imbued sense of, of honor, and of sacred bond that any clanic pact uh, entailed. But on the bigger picture, again, these were all fragmented tribes, so they were dramatically unstable. Um, Spanish chiefs and mercenaries changed sides between Rome and Carthage with alacrity, for example, so much so that Levy would write later that Quote, the restless Spanish temperament, always hungry for adventure and change. Right? There is a beautiful passage describing uh, how the Lusitanians planned their, uh, their military operations. Essentially, they, they gathered in some councils, in some hidden places. They, they would decide uh, how, where they would have to carry out a, a raid. Right? Uh, not in that case, not, not just against the Romans, I mean against any other people around, right? and just living like that. And these are the means naturally tribes have to, uh, to, to centralize in their own way, because they did not have enough surplus to consolidate um, the conditions of political survival. So the quickest way they have to, uh, to fix that is to be always on the offensive to attack adders to 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 prey them and to store their loot to hopefully call in other warriors in their retinues and uh, trying to to have enough surplus from that increasing to kind of start a minimal centralization in that process right so um they they wouldn't survive otherwise and that's how mostly also they they crashed into some of some bigger polities and uh, the problems started, of course. Um, the Celtiberians successfully combined, apparently, Celtic ferocity with Iberian stubbornness, right? Uh, Celtiberian Numantia held out, as you know, desperately against siege as, uh, as Iberian Saguntum, as a matter of fact. Uh, so, again, we're talking about similar, similar standards, uh, and that occasion ended with a similar mass suicide. Um, the Celtiberians fought Rome off and on for 60 years. The struggle would be termed by Polybius the fiery war because of its endless, continuous, uninterrupted ferocity. Um, there were as you know, Numantia was finally, you know, reached from the, the longer road uh, passing in, in the lands of other peoples that were deprived of, of, of livestock, of, agri of agricultural, of harvest, um, that it would be massively fortified. I mean, uh, you know, talking about the, the siege perimeter around the city, and it would... Uh, hold on for, for a very long time before finally succumbing to Rome and lots of other Roman armies had previously failed right to in fact Scipio Aemilianus that was the, the best Roman general at that point was called specifically to solve the problem with Numantia um, and again after the, the Romans had been committed in other theaters including for example the destruction of Carthage, right? So, um, again, always remember what could be even the uh, the Roman, especially at that point in her history, um, 
uh, need to display this counterinsurrectional capacity because that was exactly the peak of the recruitment crisis and which which meant that Rome had difficulties to send in other troops um, from the Italian mainland and uh, this strategically on on the frontier would um, uh, turn, translate itself in, in a sort of defensive position so the destruction of Carthage especially the destruction of Corinth and these other systematic brutalities were actually a very effective mean to, to show the world that the Romans didn't give a damn about anyone right if uh, a Roman the Roman Empire was essentially to be uh, to be uh, threatened even by again populations that could not quite destroy now what Rome had uh, established but could still harass her and you know make her lose the initiative there and I think drag on for a long time that's that's how this also reflected itself in the Iberian Peninsula with all those Roman uh, debacle and so on so Spanish equipment and tactics were famous universally for lightness and mobility which is obviously enough what any guerrilla warfare entails. Levy says that the Spaniards were quote well accustomed to mountain warfare and well adapted by training and equipment to rapid assaults over craggy and broken ground. Uh, that this aspect is quite fascinating but we commented in a while we just add that Plutarch describes quote the swift attacks and retreats of a set of fleet mountaineers right uh, even horses Strabo says were trained to climb mountains um, so this uh, proficiency in broken terrain uh, assault a retreat right is is crucial because uh, of course this means they knew their terrain quite well they had developed the military system that coped with especially hit and run tactics thus knowing how to move on even a, a terrain that the enemy wouldn't think could be crossed uh, especially if this enemy is habituated like the Romans could be with you know in you know moving heavier troops that needed kind of a better ground to to be moving on and so on was crucial during during ambushes, night attacks, um, on uh, right on uh, on slopes, for example, in um, in uh, again emerging from from the woods and so on. So uh, all tactics designed to surprise the enemy, to find him, of course, in a condition of of uh, of inferiority. Right, not deployed, relaxed, saying, "Okay, they will not attack from here." Instead, being able to carry out these attacks and knowing how also how to retreat, not to lose, just going against the enemy to, you know, to die uh, per se. Right, this detail um, from Strabo about the horses is also fascinating because the Barren Peninsula was full of wild horses. Um, Posidonius goes as far as saying that the Iberian mounts were better than the Numidian ones. And as you know, the, the Numidians were almost all about uh, mounted warfare. Um, it's thought that the Iberian peoples developed some kind of improved horse showing. Uh, not quite uh, the, 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 the heavier ones that existed in the Middle Ages, right, in, in, in antiquity you had at, at best uh, hippo sandals, right, but it's possible that the, the rug nature of Spain had dealt in this intensely um, bellicose um, reality, right, the, the, the capacity of, you know, adapting to the terrain in a much more effective fashion than, than in other places. Naturally, what is important here is not much the individual, but how much cohesion would a unit be able to maintain on a difficult ground, right? which is what makes, uh, again, at a collective level, the, the greatest effectiveness. There are lots of pictures of horses I uploaded here from uh, Iberian finds, uh, 
uh, there was definitely a, a deeply religious meaning attached to these animals. The Kales, uh, also fr from Goli, were a bit, you know, uh, obsessed with horses to probably injected some more of that we'll talk about. In fact, the, the Cantabrians later, uh, famously enough, for uh, for uh, cavalry tactics. Sources say that the Spanish were also not stopped by rivers. Hannibal's Spaniards, for example, swam the Rhone River supported on, on their shields. Now, these are anecdotes, right? We don't have to think that here that they had necessarily a better war system than others to, to, to swim across rivers, right? W what this means is that, of course, these warriors were quite um, fit in, in many ways, right? The, the Barian peoples had a cultistic obsession for their uh, physical fitness, right? They allegedly even, you know, tightened their belts further to, to prove they were, you know, they were not obese, they were in full shape, uh, and so on. It, they attached great importance to their physical appearance uh, as well. This is typical of kind of warlike, heroic realities where you have to prove properly you are you are from the descent from the divine stock, uh, etc. Levy, uh, in a passage uh, describing a battle between the Celtiberians and the Romans, says, quote, the Celtiberians usually fight by a series of rapid skirmishing attacks, but their speed of movement uh, in this episode was rendered useless by the rough and broken ground. Now, some people go simply saying, oh, well, you know, see, the, the, the Celtiberians uh, may have had some problems with difficult terrain. I, I don't think this is the case, right? Um, there is no reason why the Celtiberians should have had or the Barians not. Again, it's always the same problem of collective, um, you know, order, right? So, Livy, first of all, is speaking of this specific um, episode in which we don't know how rough and broken the ground was compared to the average, right? So, uh, the, uh, the 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 Celtiberians here are still depicted as skirmishers carrying out uh, hit and run tactics, basically. But it's unlikely for them to have been less able to fight on difficult terrain than say the the southern Iberians. Um, the reason being that first of all, the Celtiberians lived in actually even more mountainous. Um, territories than the the Iberians normally, and uh, this would necessarily actually develop some kind of greater aptness to fight on the mountains, as those peoples actually also in the following centuries always kind of were were able to, right? So this may be just uh, that there is always a limit to that. Right, doesn't matter how apt you are to fight on a given terrain. If if the terrain sucks, it still will bring you some tactical and strategic difficulties. Um, there are no supermen here, um, and especially, you know, when when you don't have much of a great collective training, uh, you will feel kind of terrain e even more. Um, so this may be actually a, a reason, but. Um, not necessarily, you know, one we can extend to some broader structural problems that now the Kelty Barons had compared to the Barons, right? It's, it sounds as a superficial interpretation, right? So the, the sources are actually very clear about the thing being unspecific, right? So making a hypothesis out of, out of this, you know, doesn't make much sense. Um, uh, naturally, with lightly armed troops, as sources say, uh, in the narrow passes between wooded hills, which are typical of Spain, ambushes were a popular tactic. The Lusitanians, as we've seen, were quite successful against the Romans at that, the Celtic as well. So, in this regard, 
always remember those were the peoples living in the interland. So it's more likely to fall in an ambush there because the environment is wilder. You are entering it from, again, a, a more civilized and pacified reality. It was easy to control the coasts and the immediate interland. When you enter this foreign land for the first time, you're much more subject to ambushes. That's why the Romans suffered famously enough loss of ambushes in their in their military history, not because they were better or worse than other peoples at scouting or exploring uh, or skirmishing, whatever. It's just that they were the occupation forces, thus uh, they, uh, they were more likely just to fall in, in ambushes, right? Uh, that's that's the thing. The exception confirming the rule is this: is the Battle of the Trasimene Lake, which you know was fought in in Italy itself. But there you had Hannibal, and you know one of the greatest uh, military commanders in history. And you have there the ambush par excellence in the entire annals of of warfare. Um, so were raids and skirmishes, right? In, in short, all the tactics one would expect from a country which invented the word guerrilla. It was just in, in, in their veins, right? Most of their life, again, even uh, aside from the Roman conquest, etc., had historically been about raiding, right? Neighboring tribes always being, again, in this kind of uh, environment where there is not even properly a, an outline territorial boundary of some sort that can be respected. So it's, it was always war bands going out there, trying, in some cases succeeding, seizing the land, the women, uh, the cattle, other times getting, getting slaughtered in the process, uh, essentially devoting themselves to this uh, enterprises were of course all divinely um, mandate and and just having their life about this right it uh, when, when you live in these realities even if you are an average peasant you have a, a basic sense about what raiding warfare is right because you're never just like only the victim or the purpose raider you're both at the same time you, you know what what stealing a cow from a neighbor is since you were a kid, right? As much as consequently feud, uh, you know, you know, revenge, clanic clashes, massacres, torture, all what you can't imagine really was, right? You know, you would have not wanted to be a Roman prisoner, you know, taken by by the, by the barbarians. They would sacrifice you to their deities. They would torture you. It would be all a, a cult, of, of course, of, of, of war, just as the primary identity, the primary political, cultural, and moral identity of these people. Um, again, I'm making it even sound nice, but you you have to picture what this properly means. Uh, consider that, that that sense of equal rights, a sense of, you know, terrible idea of killing a person does not exist in this world, right? It's completely unknown, right? Or at least there is by a degree, because every person has a different price, right? There is a, a great sense of, you know, how, you know, legal and fair and, you know, for what that means, of course, in these communities to, to actually kill people. There is, it's not even a big deal. And you're just nurtured in this reality. And you see it with your own eyes regularly, since you're a child. Um, now, talking about the Spanish infantry segmentation, uh, there are two main categories that stand out, not differently, as we were seeing at the beginning, basically from any other people around at this point. The scutari and the Caetrati, right? Naturally, these are Latin names, uh, which are referred to the uh, to the shield. Bear in mind that the Romans normally called units on the base of their weapons, right? Not on their of, of their shields, but their uh, specifically. 
was the Greeks the, the thing. However, I will not try to answer why this was the case for for these um, for describing the Spanish. However, it's the picture that is quite uh, is outlined to to be quite uh, eloquent per se. So the, the scutari would be the heavy infantry. We would advance performing. We see it from this basis. So there is some picture about that there. Some war dances uh, before the, uh, the the battle line, invoking the, the deities, uh, devoting themselves, and charging. Uh, after having, you know, hyped like that with a shower of thrown spears, and then closing with swords. Like, so, normally, also the Romans did, right? This was the standard heavy infantry tactics out there. There wasn't practically any other, except for the for the the, the phalanxes of the Hellenic slash Hellenistic world uh, that function on, on a different principle. Um, it was pretty much standard. Would, did these troops had a a loose cohesion, right? They had, of course, a degree of of of, of discipline, of collective uh, compactness, and their point was to throw the the spears uh, all at once, right? To maximize uh, the the immediate uh, disorder, damage, and kind of uh, amazement of the enemy, and pass into the swords of going at them, and you know that. As you have seen here, we still haven't arrived to the Falcatas, but from the pictures that have already passed in the background, you realize how no difference existed between ancient combat and plain butchering, right? Uh, blood was all over the place, right? And a lot of blood. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a person bleeding, but you know, I mean, just from small wounds, and consider what 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 a falcata can do, right? Chopping heads and, and limbs and, and whatever. Uh, the, consider that, um, as you will see, there were heavier troops. Also, in the case of the scutari, like there wasn't much of a difference. Armor was mostly that. You know, the, there were chain mails uh, introduced, especially from from the Celtic world. There were pectorals, other, you know. Um, plate like greaves, uh, vambers, uh, things like that. But mostly these peoples, like all the tribal ones, and don't think that the Romans were that kind of all perfectly chain mailed and everything. Like you know, that's yet another picture we get wrong all the time. It most of them are de facto unarmored, in or they have at least a very you know soft kind of armor, uh, and uh, this means that. Considering, uh, as we find out from the Barian gra uh, graves, in a, in a such in a in a warlike militarized world, uh, all had this uh, warlike cult, right? You know, they all were buried with their weapons. Um, so the 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 just the degree of exposure to this violence was omnipresent. You see, probably from the Iberian equipment that there is uh, an extremely dynamic panoplistic combination here, made of a lot of cutting, right? A lot of fast, quick, brutal, uh, you know, uh, horrendously damaging blows. Uh, and the Every warrior was was properly trained for that, right? Independently from how he would fight eventually in information, whether in a more thickly packed, uh, heavy infantry context or just as a skirmisher, mounted or dismounted, right? There was also a very quick switch between cavalry to, to infantry warfare, uh, quite quite easily. And when you look at the falcata, you realize there they would mostly be, I don't know, 60 centimeters in length. However, they're basically sabers, right? There is a lot there about, about cavalry warfare that you can appreciate if you consider the, the, the extent of the spread of that particular weapon. We'll see 
also the, the other types later, but that thing is just very, very barren, right? You don't see any other people that um, uses to this extent such a curved, uh, narrow kind of, uh, and fairly long sword um, on a regular basis. And that obviously can't help you but thinking about also the degree of mounted warfare in Reconquista times, properly the, the nature of the Spanish landscape. This, as we've seen, this great base plains among, between the, you know, uh, the various hill forts, ideal for raiding, hit and run tactics that are properly a, a big thing in the Iberian Peninsula. Right? This, is, this is important. If you were to compare Iberian warfare to the Central European one, at this point, we would see that the Central Europeans fought in a much more compact fashion, right? They had, um, by degree, also a greater capacity to bring on the field larger troops for larger engagements. They have uh, a greater idea of how to uh, properly throw the mass in, right? Because the Celts were famous for that towards the, the later centuries were probably heading towards something more compact, right? They could resist more um, but it's much more like um, frontal engagement of you know consistent bodies of kind of you could say line infantry um, Spain is much lighter it's much more insidious there are many more darts uh, much more curved swords much more um, probably light cavalry Right, uh, not something just functionalized as heavy cavalry and heavy infantry that monopolizes statistically the, the whole picture. No, it, there is a lot of skirmishing involved, a vicious guerrilla warfare as the bread of every youth in 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 the in the region. Uh, when we look at the Scutari, we realize that a bit of that sense of, you know, Celtic fury or Iberian fury was there, right? The initial charge was quite powerful. The Scutari were um, often able to break through even a Roman battle line, right? Uh, if the line was held, the Spaniards were still formidable with their swords that are quite dynamically used. However, at that point, Roman discipline and armor would usually beat them, right? The Romans were, were at this point, quite kind of sturdily built as heavy infantry to coldly and brutally um, cope with these kind of more heated and kind of more biting, aggressive, but still kind of uh, hitting and running enemy, right? So the the Spanish infantries were capable of performing both, right? The Romans probably were, were, were amazed with this, right? With the idea that were some of the, the best infantrymen that had ever met at that point, but they still overall, the, they were diluted in a, in a cloud of lighter troops that would also render more difficult the identification of where this this heavier troops were were coming from. Which was the the big deal, right? When this people said, you know, it wasn't much of a tactics behind this. When you look at how the Spanish carried out their ambushes against the Romans, um you you see that they were able to 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 feign flights, not much to lure, just to lure the Romans, but properly to exhaust them because they could perform this over and over again. And this can't quite be done repeatedly uh, with that consistency if there isn't um, some sort of preparation, some sort of basis to retreat to, to regroup. So that could stem from knowledge of terrain, sometimes it could be just Again, you, you don't retreat when we say that feigned flight is a tactic. Well, sometimes, but most of the times when it's a, some kind of consistent engagement, it, it's really, let's try to break in the first place, and then if we can't, let's fall back, and that can also easily turn into a rout. But the 
the Baron peoples carried out this tactic so um, so consistently uh, and so systematically that uh, it, it, it that you realize it was evidently some kind of strategic preparation there, right? That would be able to exhaust an enemy army for, for days and days and attacks and attacks. So that's actually a hyper development of that specific tactics. It's a sort of systematic one, properly as, a, as an almost identitary fashion to fight. Again, this is not just like, I don't know, the kind of Celtic show off in, in open ground, even to their deaths. Against the the more drilled and you know, you know, disciplined Roman armies, this is a systematization of ambushes and guerrilla and, and skirmishes. Um, to an unknown degree, at least in in Europe, right, and uh, in in sedentary Europe, and it must be taken into account also as a degree of rationalization of local warfare. That n naturally, this was, again, dictated by the uh, strength ratio involved, uh, the, the political and social possibilities of these peoples that translated themselves in these tactics that would have changed if, you know, they had had a major advantage. Of course, there were pitched battles among the, the Spaniards, right? Um, that thing did exist. However, they were likely rarer than, than in other places, right? Because of the nature of these communities and, and, uh, and the terrain and so on. Uh, a variation on the usual single mass of infantry uh, for the Scutari was to form three bodies with gaps between them to allow the cavalry to charge through. Um, this would take the shape of a wedge, often, formation, which is not literally thinking that there is a triangle that charges into the enemy. That thing does not exist. There is rather a battle line where you have a section of it that is stronger, uh, the rest mostly being there to avoid kind of outflanking you know, and by the other infantry, remember the Romans could carry that out ever since the Second Punic Wars in the moment in which they were there for Carthage but had de facto already invaded the Barian Peninsula and were there to stay. And kind of smashing through with that concentration of forces in, in a specific section of the line. So to exploit not a gap between the units or but literally a major breakthrough to make also the cavalry pouring through. Right, this is this is the concept. Uh, always remember that because there is no such thing in warfare like you know an enemy an enemy being able to exploit the gaps between the naturally existing between a unit and another. Uh, the gaps have to be in that sense as large as an entire unit to make it pass through. Otherwise, you basically do not gain any advantage because in order to pour into that gap, you have to break your own formation and you just lose. Right? And people often think that I don't know the Romans won against. Uh, even, I don't know, the phalanx, whatever, because they exploited the gaps that exist between the various units. That's ridiculous. Uh, that's yet another indicator that, tactically wise in this case, completely zero uh, as a concept. And especially there's not a single evidence of that, right? Because the, the gaps breaking, say, in a battle line that has broken, it's, it's not the gaps that exist naturally between units which also the Romans had, by the way, but it's not, every every army has, right? And that those are notoriously, they have notoriously nothing to do with any doctrinal exploitation of those gaps from a tactical point of view. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and the, the Celtiberians seemingly made greater use of the wedge formation, uh, the sources stating that they were so good at it, that they charged so powerfully through that, that the troops in any place in which the Celtic barons heard their attack were unable to withstand the shock. Naturally, this is an hyperbole, because it's not always true, but it, it tells you how probably there was a bit of Celtic furor uh, that was added. Right. The impression that I got so far in my uh, general reds uh, 
in terms of the difference between Celtic variants and Iberians as far as infantry is concerned because cavalry was was very important but it was usually light right you you don't see in Sp there was in Spain very heavy cavalry definitely but it was very ultra elite also numerically so it was almost irrelevant right the majority of cavalry was really skirmishers right and the idea there is that the the barons also in in, uh, in Roman service would provide with so it takes probably very large amounts of troops because the south was more populated, it, w it was more civilized, it was more pacified. The Romans had it easier to use those troops, and these were also kind of warlike, right? Do, do not underestimate Iberian warriors because they are really also sometimes also more scientific in the way they fight, but they are more um, gentrified already. They're softer by a degree. So they are also more disciplined, more easily disciplined by the Roman instructors and such things. However, they um, they they have lost part of their kind of aggressiveness. Um, the Celtiberian North was poorer by degree, and the idea being, in fact, that the majority of their infantry was not even properly heavy. Right, meaning that it could stand their ground. It were more like skirmishers or something like that. Um, possibly they had even better horse skirmishers than the, the southerners. However, they had kind of still better shock infantries. Uh, this is perhaps true also for the Lusitanians, right? This is the impression that I got, right? And probably the most aggressive infantry is also some of some also the finest equipped ones, because this 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 idea that the majority of infantry was relatively lighter also speaks for some kind of more feudal mindset coming from Central Europe in a Celtic fashion uh, and probably having a bit more of heroic warfare I mean there to um, to develop right it's it again they are just approximations I'm not saying that this was just so evident nor that we can be completely sure about that but this is what you know my guts tell me just uh, on the basis of what I've what I've seen. Uh, the second category of troopers was, uh, in fact, existing also among the Iberians, were, we said it before, the Caetrati. So the name comes from the Caetra, so this buckler uh, in, say, 30, 60 centimeters in diameter. Uh, used mostly by, in fact, light infantry skirmishers that had to be lighter, running more, and so on. Um, this infantry was not just light, right? Some were prepared properly to charge home and were superior to um, proper skirmishers in, in the form of just guys without any armor going there skirmishing and nothing. Some Kaitrati were equipped with helmets, uh, chest plates, falcatai. So they were actually heavy infantry, as a matter of fact, because, again, always remember that the distinction between heavy and light infantry classically is just, you know, which one is just meant to hold the ground or not when they fight. That's it, right? So that's just how you measure them. So even a guy with you know, that more modest equipment, lighter than a Scutarius, was still employed as a heavy infantryman. Needless to say, these were better suited troops also for those aforementioned uh, rough and broken ground tactics, like hap hills in ambushes and difficult terrain, whatever. They could move more easily. Naturally, Imagine living, I don't know, in the forests of Lusitania or these things. It, it, it makes you very, very kind of habituated to the various pathway to the just living in the forest, uh, knowing how to hunt, right? Not to be, not to make a sound, uh, to be spot by the prey. It can be an animal as much as an enemy, or the same thing, and as much as also ki the killing part is concerned. Um, so this, this is already disturbing for what was starting to become at this point that a gentrified kind of Italic uh, farmer as 
the, that the Romans would have shipped to, to Spain to, to cope with these guys. Um, there are instances in which the Spanish troops are used by the Carthaginians and the Romans against the Africans. So, essentially the Moors and the Numidians. And on these occasions, the Spanish Caetrati, either infantry or cavalry, mm -hmm. were able to defeat the Africans. This is quite interesting, because from the sources we get first that they, the Spanish managed to catch even these lighter forces, like consider that the Moors, the Numidians, etc. were very, very light. Right, not entirely. They were kind of some kind of heavy infantry as well. We'll make videos about that. I made already something about the Numidians, but overall, right, the average Numidian guy was just, you know, they had a a buckler themselves, a weaker shield, and you know, a couple spears slash uh, lances, or, or or more actually skirmishers, because they mostly specialized in that, or, and or mounted or dismounted. Well, the the Barian Kaitrati were successful against them. And that's for also for what I was saying before. I mean, if you were to see that in perspective as, I don't know, a Spanish cavalryman of the Reconquista against a Berber uh, Moorish one, we know that they chased them. We know that they were generally heavier and more successful. So it's as if that thing had remained, right? Um, and this is important because normally the heavier troops, including the Roman ones, had trouble chasing the the African lights, right? Also the Carthaginians that, that mostly used the same troops, but they had to employ the Spanish ones to, to chase them. Um, naturally, they would beat them at close quarters because that's also the concept. I mean, if you chase them, you also have the capacity, hopefully, to, to take them down. Uh, in fact, the sources say that on that occasion, the, the Spanish were the equals of the the Africans in speed, but superior to them in strength and daring, right? So this unequivocally points at a higher political cohesion and military quality of the Iberian peoples compared to the North Africans. And objectively, yes, because North Africa was, aside from Carthage, was a sort of civilizing, you know, uh, graft on uh, in the land. It was one of the single most developed civilizations existing at the time. The, the, the African interland was quite uh, backwards, right? It was one of the few places, like in Northern Europe, which still had war chariots, just to make an example, up to a certain point. Um, and the consistency of these, this African people was so loose that, again, it was not easy to fight there for many reasons. But um, there were also kind of less qualitative troops uh, in many ways. And, um, otherwise, the Caetrati could form a reserve in say, pitch battles deployed on, on the flanks, for example, to exploit better, uh, you know, the flank, in fact, uh, to outmaneuver the enemy, or supporting the cavalry as well, right? There were surely lighter troops that ran it after their, their own horses, um, their own cavalry, I mean, to to both on foot and on horseback. In fact, in, in the latter case, it seemed that the Caetrati would ride a peon behind the horsemen and they would dismount to fight, right? Proving also that, of course, infantry was the decisive arm in Spain as well uh, uh, on a regular basis. Um, consider again that these uh, environments are very... Also, missile warfare oriented. I mean, think about even slingers were something. They were the same Balearic ones were employed um, in land. Uh, you could find them as mercenaries, etc. So, the idea that it's all about hit and run because every resource is then darn precious. You have to always maintain the balance in this incredibly tumultuous um, political 
a reality and you have to be very careful about every single loss you can take of course would make you also less going just for it directly and mostly just testing the enemy through repeated uh, harassment skirmishes raids and not necessarily a major um, engagement uh, where you would try kind of everything. The, the missile warfare there is, is meaningful because you can't even have a good cavalry, but uh, cavalry costs and if there is a lot of even properly infantry missile potential around you have to be careful with that and that reduces remarkably even the, the effectiveness of the same cavalry and how far you can employ it. That's the reason why mostly um, Spanish cavalry was, was light, right? Because they, they had the, the, you know, heavy equipment were some kind of even cataphracts, likely. Yes, the, we, we find them in some sources depicted probably important horse armor. Um, and that's because, as we've seen, there were lots of... Um, uh, there was lots of metals for first of all around and uh, very high metallurgic skills so the elites would surely be able to afford by some degree even uh, a horse scale armor of some sort especially in the south right uh, whereas and not necessarily that would make um, better cavalry overall likely the best cavalry was actually in the north in fact among the cantabrians we'll see now because it's the, the cavalry here is really uh, a key element right um from one side we see that we're prepared to fight on foot when necessary right sometimes led by a general hannibal used his spanish cavalry as shock troops uh they and the gauls are called steady in contrast with the Numidians. I remember what we said before about the Africans, because at Cannae, uh, you know, that these cavalries were used for, as you know, the remarkable three charges um, on the Roman flanks that are something that you cannot carry out if you do not have an adequate level of training. Naturally, the Carthaginians there had intensively trained uh, these troops, especially the, the Spanish and the Gauls, because they weren't as collectively drilled uh, as the Numidians, for example. The Numidians were better horsemen collectively, so that um, even if individually, as we've seen, they could be chased and killed by the heavies, of course, they still had more um, overall, more, more agility. And this is not to say, because we've seen that they could be reached even, by by the the barons at the round, but the barons were also on average heavier. So in spite of that note that we read, we don't have to literally think that you could simply send any unit just to, to chase the Numidians because the Numidians were the best in that form of avoidal in the first place. So it was a risk anyhow. Um, the Romans used uh, Spanish auxiliaries against the Numidians as well. Um, and vice versa, they brought Numidians, famously enough, think about Jugurtha in, uh, during the Numantine War, uh, etc. In any case, what the Hannibal example proves is that, of course, there was an important shock capacity among the Celtiberian cavalries that, if properly trained and channeled, uh, you know, could uh, score significant results. Um, this the cavalry would charge um, the enemy one. Normally, that's how they were designed, or the flanks and rear infantry when they managed to outflank it, having broken the the enemy wings. Right, that's how it mostly happens. Sometimes, as you know, they would simply chase the cavalry and wouldn't come back because it was still a matter of. You know, you have to break the enemy, not just making it flee. And so that that's the problem. You can always keep a distance and lure the enemy away from the battlefield. As it happened, for example, at Zama, also in other circumstances. But um, Spanish cavalry could also and would also consistently skirmish, as we've seen. 
um, the Imperial Roman cavalry tactic, the Cantabrian cycle, betrays its Iberian origins by its name. And again, as we were saying before, the Cantabrians were in the far north. So that speaks actually for some degree of, you know, moral force that had remained in such uh, places, even if they were less developed from the southern ones that, however, had essentially given way to Rome, etc. Th those peoples, the Asturias, that they, they would hold out for, for a longer time. And also when they were allied with the Romans, we know that they, they took more time to just to be Romanized in the first place. But they would provide with these troops later on. What is fascinating is that the Romans, as much as the Numidians, for example, used Iberian bodyguards, which is fascinating, mostly because of the practice of this and a fanatic devotion, right? You know that the Romans used also Germanic bodyguards and so on. So all, all from peoples that were fanatically loyal when at least they were provided with adequate uh, pay and let's say a reason to, um, you know, to to, to fight uh, uh, at the service of of generals of emperors. I mean that that would was surely a great prestige to work you know, the children of the local aristocracy. Today we didn't open various parentheses, such as, for example, the fact that there were some Romans that uh, defected. They, they uh, essentially passed to the Iberian side. They rode the wave of local revolts. There are some Romans, for example, the time of Viriatus that led troops. Um, there is... Of course, um, the most famous episode of Sertorius in the 1st century BC who carried out a parallel program of Romanization of these peoples uh, but against the uh, the Roman political points so of the actually the, the Roman government of Spain also adopting some Celtic practices. There was the, the white phone uh, for example, that followed him, that was considered, um, uh, you know, a, an indicator of syntony with um, with the divinity for, for many reasons. Now, can't digress. Um, however, there was, as you understand, in two centuries of prolonged warfare, a degree of commixtion and, of, you know, uh, hybrid uh, that took place, naturally mostly in favor of the Romanization of the land, um, which would start would speak of romance to this very day from an Iberian background that had uh, essentially nothing to do with that um, but um, there was also a lot of Iberianness that was transferred especially in the Roman military and that we often don't recognize as much we mostly talk about the Celts that surely had probably the largest influence in terms of the development of Roman, uh, the Roman panoply, the, the, say, the, at least the early imperial one. Uh, but aside from the fact that naturally there were Celts from, as we've seen, from the same Iberian Peninsula, the, the, the Iberian world did uh, add something, because the Spanish cavalry always remained there as a very like, uh, high... Uh, m you know, level of horsemanship, of zootechnical knowledge, equestrian skills in general. So that uh, deserves surely another video on its own, to say the least. Um, but the Cantabrian tactics are known. You, it would be a sort of caracol, right? The, the cavalry would gallop around in a circle that on a battlefield, we don't know how much of a circle it really was. The most important thing was that there was a cyclical movement for which the part of, of the curve that got closer to the enemy would will right, um, so uh, exposing the, the, the left flank with a shield, so to, to parry any blow that would come from the enemy and throwing the javelin. Now, it, this is not much of a you know, uh, prefer tactics because the best would be to uh, 
uh, to throw, as we've seen also before, all kind of javelins at once, not this centellinated kind of throw one javelin at a time. Just what, what you obtain like that is just a, a constant fire, but also a much diluted one. And most of what that used like is uh, Cantabrian maneuver. There was a sort of just of an evolution it was carried out also in, I don't know, games, etc. It was just a way to, to prove to be able to perform various uh, movements on horseback that the various unit collectively etc the tactical usefulness of that is just maintaining a minimal yet constant pressure on the enemy so that you can distract him as opposed to kind of dramatic showdowns so that however once you exhaust the 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 javelins of the entire unit you have to somehow stop right and fall back and so not exerting that much pressure anymore um, so that's fundamentally what the Cantabrian tactics really is. It's not a particularly impacting one. And that's also what I was saying before, that uh, you know, it can be a, a great horseman, but not necessarily so having a dramatic individual skill, but not necessarily carrying out a tactic that has much of a great collective uh, effectiveness, just per se. Um, uh it's mm, yeah. It's possible naturally that Celtiberian cavalry may have maintained some kind of uh, kind of received some kind of Gallic influx, some kind of maybe uh, greater shock element. But this is doubtful, just in terms of equipment. If anything, as I said before, it's probable that the Celtiberians had less, but somehow more shock-based cavalry um, than the. Iberians overall, it was still maintained kind of a more homogeneous kind of medium standard, whereas the the rest of Celtiberian cavalry would even be lighter than the one of the south. Um, cavalry would start a battle on the wings, or in reserve, normally. They were good troops, right? Uh, albeit, as we've seen, not of great tactical importance, right? And this has to do also with the terrain that often was racked as we've seen so cavalry needs its own spaces its own ground um, and uh, you know that can create problems and infantry surely can um, can cope with that better but naturally losing the advantage of being cavalry and that's partly why as we have seen sources tell that uh, these Spanish uh, cavalries and the impression is especially the Celtiberian ones would dismount to fight with a with a with an important frequency, right? The rest is just explained by the um, the lack of a feudal culture fundamentally. These tribes were fundamentally well balanced socially. They, they were that's why they were somehow tough. Naturally, there was some kind of hierarchical. Uh, segmentation as we've seen and another reason being uh, the terrain probably discouraging even though there were lots of horses some kind of kind of larger tactics just politically speaking they couldn't field some huge numbers of troops right and mostly they would carry out their guerrilla warfare so they wouldn't properly even need to have a, a dramatic shock capacity where you could war wear out the enemy without exposing yourself, if that was the strategic uh, uh, strength ratio, right? Um, so this is the picture. In general, we could talk about lots of different things. Uh, as I was saying before, there is also a lot about the Iberian metallurgy, and we will perhaps make another video about the um, the Latin swords that were straight and there is um, specific types that developed in Spain that also the Romans adopt uh, even in the Baltic like in kind of some decorative style meaning that there was a substantial military apological culture that the Romans wanted to imitate the falcati were exceptional weapons uh, from the carbon the, the level of carbon content in the iron, we can see that they had a, an excellent tampering and cementation. Uh, and 
the Romans, even when they, they, they conquered Spain, were never able to fully replicate the same uh, metallurgic standards of the of the Iberians forts, interestingly enough. Um, they would use different ones. Normally the, the falcata was kind of more widespread than the, the straight types that the Romans would adopt more uniformly, right? Uh, and don't get me wrong, the, especially the scutari were equipped with that kind of more straight blade. Uh, however, as we've seen before, there were also, um, say not always, right? considered that the main weapon was the, the spear in the first place, so they would pass the swords uh, in uh, either when they had thrown the spears entirely and or they, by some degree, they had decided to close in more, more directly, but even as far as what they could hope to, to expect from the abandonment of a of a spear line, right, as they could form one. Um, the Romans naturally would implement on uh, what they, they would transform in the gladius hispaniensis, so that um, the Roman gladius is not quite the same weapon that you see being in use in Spain. Naturally, it was modeled on it, though, so that also has to be taken in consideration. Um, uh, and it, it's important to stress that, first of all, the Romans mostly neutralized the, the Iberian problem in terms of an autonomous population that could pick arms against them, essentially in the 2nd century BC, with, with the success of the siege of Numantia. Then there would be other revolts, but uh, the, the country had undergone a significant Romanization. So the Romans kept using the gladius, and, and what you realize is that, especially even since the first models, is that the, the gladius was not like this short kind of curved thing that we think normally of. It, it looked much more like a sort of a Latin sword, like a fairly sizable and straight blade, right, that had actually a, a huge deal of cutting capacity, not just a trusting one which is often misunderstood. And eventually, in early imperial times, yes, it did evolve towards that kind of became shorter and more trusting, right? And uh, in, in, because it was more functional to a particular fencing. But always considered that there were spati being used, also by the infantry, not just by the cavalry. And that we, we don't know exactly what the proportion uh, really was. Uh, we know actually very few about the Roman army per se, so mm, don't give for granted things that are not necessarily there. In, in any case, um, bear in mind that the also the kind of this very variant, as we've seen, and um, diversified Iberian context is the one that stimulated Rome the most as far as their sword. Um, so essentially the, the, the most important weapon w w was concerned, right? Uh, which you kind of rarely hear, right? In a, in a hierarchical order, right? And uh, because, and part of the reason is that Nowadays, people get fixated with some cultures rather than others for ethno-nationalistic reasons pertaining to con the contemporary world. But looking at this in an unbiased way is a challenge worth being uh, undertaken because it can't tell you much more about, you know, lots of things that were going on in ancient warfare that are just under our eyes, but sometimes we, we we make relativism about with fixating on some details that do not quite get to the essential of the thing. Naturally, as I said at the beginning of the video, there is really a lot to do about Iberian warfare. Today we didn't talk about the Soliferum, for example. We didn't talk about the Falarica. We didn't talk about lots of things that just per se are not perhaps what, um, you know, uh, made entirely a barren warfare, but that are worth concentrating, in fact, better in a video about arms and armor.
of these people. So we will do that also in the military historical unit series. We will hopefully look at the the Barians, the Celtic Barians, the Lusitanians, also separately, and maybe making videos about um, different peoples at this point from the ancient world separately. Uh, in a series on its own. For today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.